It's Tuesday, August 28th, and some more news happened. Mostly the RTX 2080, which we're going to get to a little later in the program. But for now, we've got a lot of, what is it, business news? Only in your world <laughs> is the RTX 2080 the biggest development. I mean, they're going to impeach the president. California's burning. That one guy died. McCain. McCain died. Uh, Venezuela was racked by earthquakes. But the 2080 is the biggest news. I really like Jensen's new leather jacket. I mean, his leather jacket was really, like, super amazing. Who? The CEO of NVIDIA. Oh, God. Fucking <laughs> name drops. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I can't name McCain, but by God, I know Jensen Wong. Well, speaking of the wildfires... It brings up an incredible human interest story that happens to have a lot to do with technology. Because when you're, when you're an ISP, you want to you wring every dollar out of your customer, right? But you have to be careful because sometimes there's customers you don't want to really milk dry because they are uh, important in some ways. And uh, maybe the most important, the people trying to save your life. <laughs> I loved when this story first came out. If we didn't do this on a delay a little bit, we couldn't tell you just the most amazing schadenfreude around this. So there were so many people that came out to Verizon's defense saying that they weren't on the right plan and that they didn't choose correctly and whatever because they're on Verizon's quote-unquote unlimited plan. It's not actually unlimited. There are limitations. The limitations are spelled out in the plan for us plebs. But it also emerged that the firefighters in question who had their data limited had talked to Verizon about these data caps. And Verizon said, no, no, because you are emergency services people, when there is a legit emergency, call customer service and we will lift the caps. That doesn't count. It's just your firefighters, you know, watching Netflix or whatever on standby. That's the only thing that counts to your caps. Lo and behold, there was an emergency and Verizon said you need to pay up. The thing that took them over their cap was the mobile command station. So they've got a truck that they drive around and they use that to coordinate all the firefighters. So data is constantly coming in and out of this truck. They quickly hit the cap. And when they did hit the cap, they again called Verizon. And they were told, yeah, you need to upgrade to this other plan. Which they did, because they had no choice. <laughs> but in retrospect, Verizon's like, oh, did we make a mistake there? Uh, yeah, you, you don't have to do that. Don't worry. But it's... How much help is that when the fire has already raged yeah. and been fought? They were limited to uh, 200. Was it 600? I thought it was six, I thought it was 600 for some of it. Well, 200, 600. I mean, but it's, when we're it's, talking about yeah. coordinating probably dozens of fire teams. That's uh, it's ridiculous. This is also know. like this is also like the communication aspects of this are one of the not the communication, but like if there was a legitimate corporate interest in communicating what the actual problem is or managing things, I would not have as much of a problem with this as I do. The problem is that Verizon and people working in Verizon's interests hide behind misleading terminology. And so it's like, uh, we're, you know, throttling is okay for reasonable network management. The problem is that Verizon will oversell and will throttle needlessly. I mean, 600 kilobit or 200 kilobit is no bandwidth at all basically. And I'm sure that their network is not so congested that that's a reasonable speed. That's a purely punitive measure. And it's hard to explain that to non-technical people, but that is 100% a purely punitive, that has nothing to do with the technology measure. That is a speed that is slow enough that you will notice and be in pain and pay more for. I bet the guys in that truck several times during that whole encounter said, what the fuck? <laughs> or maybe if they were a little more sensitive to words, some people are afraid of words, they might have said WTF or <laughs> FML. But you're going to have to be careful because those words might belong to somebody else soon. <laughs> Procter & Gamble is uh, trying to trademark LOL, WTF, and other acronyms. This is, I mean, The Guardian brings us this story. Why is this not everywhere? I mean, I've, I, <laughs> there should have already been a Mia Culpa posted to Twitter about this. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's been an update. But it's exactly what it sounds like. So Procter & Gamble, you, you see all these headlines. It's like, millennials have killed soap. <laughs> you know? And it, they've done the, the research, and it seems like the younger generation, they don't associate with brands. They need like 
what new, what? hot new brands that represent them, you know, like their generation. So Procter & Gamble, they're going to sell them the same products. It's going to be the same soap, but it's going to be like lol soap <laughs> for young hip people, you know, and it's going to be bright pink. And uh, <laughs> with so, glitter and all kinds of so that's micro why, beads. They're trying to rat, they're trying to patent all these phrases because the and you and you can tell like that's really not the phrases that you would go after hipsters with. I don't think because it's those really aren't. I mean, how long have people been using LOL? <laughs> but <laughs> AOL the soap the, <laughs> <laughs> the PNG boardroom. They think that's that's where it's at. So they're trying to patent those, and that I assume that would mean. They would probably go after anybody who, like, let's say you made a T-shirt with LOL on it. How many T-shirts do you think are out there with LOL on them? <laughs> thousands. Hundreds of thousands. And uh, I, I bet they would try to go after that if yeah. they got this. Yeah, I'm sure that they would. I mean, think about, uh, you know, like Ajax, the household name Ajax. It's like, oh, Ajax, so that was really big in the 60s, and now no one cares. They talked about some other people who have managed to uh, trademark things, like Paris Hilton has That's Hot. <laughs> So, <laughs> poor Paris Hilton. Yeah, there's there's a chance oh, they could get them, which is absolutely terrifying. I don't know how we, like, who do you who do you protest to speak out against this? If you're like, I'm going to boycott Procter and Gamble, go into your kitchen right now, just start throwing stuff away and your bathroom because <laughs> they make half of everything, and Unilever makes the other half. <laughs> yeah, yeah, now, it's it's not good. I'm going to preface this week. There's too much Tesla. I, <laughs> I love reporting on Tesla, especially when it's bad and everybody knows that. And oh, it drives them crazy. And guess what? Here's a pro suffering from bullying tip that feeds it. <laughs> the more you let me know that I annoy you, the more I want to do it. <laughs> so, but, but this week is a bit much. I'm hoping because this is sort of a, I think the wave has crested. And hopefully we get a trickle down of like, we're not going to hear as much from Tesla. From yeah. On. Yeah. I think that's probably true. I think things have, have sort of come to a head with regard, unless, unless Musk just like I, the thing, the only thing that Musk could really do to top what the last few weeks is to show up naked to work, tripping on acid. That would definitely be a headline. Well, the first headline it's uh so this is kind of a incendiary headline. UBS, the bank, the investing bank did a, Tesla teardown. And what is not really mentioned here, or at least it's just sort of a, a, a footnote, is the electrical system and the drivetrain got top marks. So you would expect the electrical system in a Tesla to be pretty good, right? I you mean, would expect that that would be the number one safety concern <laughs> that's going to get the most attention. Right. And the drivetrain, you know, they don't have to worry about any of the normal things that most call like the transmission and, you know, it's an electric motor. Pretty simple. So that makes sense. But the fit and finish. The build quality got solidly below average. They found missing bolts. <laughs> they found giant gaps. They found, you know, like gaps that'll create road noise because wind is coming through them and different. But they found some zip ties in there. <laughs> so they really, they, they put down the Tesla. Tesla responded and they were like, eh, we're improving, basically. That's what hmm. they said. It's interesting. There was a, there was a thing not, not related to this story, but somebody took a picture of their brand new Model 3 that was delivered three of the interior fabric panels on their brand new white model S or model three were white. One of them was Brown. No one had noticed until they bought it <laughs> and they didn't notice until their kids were getting in the back seat. The other report is, uh, the, similar to that, although the, the UBS teardown didn't find it is there's some sort of fabric guard on the rear bumper and it's easily destroyed. And if you destroy it, the rear bumper will slowly fill up with water from the road as you drive when it's raining. And when it hits a certain amount of fullness, a shock will just tear it off. <laughs> so there were a couple of people that tweeted pictures. One guy tweeted a picture and he's like, hey, I bought it. My Tesla was delivered today. The bumper fell off. <laughs> and then somebody replies like, hey, my Tesla bumper fell off too. And so Tesla was like, oh, that could happen. I imagine that's probably easy for them to fix. But that's another thing. It's like, uh, Design around that, maybe. Uh, That's a thing with with uh, cinder uh, cinder block walls and block walls and any kind of masonry. It's like you're supposed to put a little piece of fabric behind the wall, leading to the front of the wall, so that moisture will wick out from behind the wall to the front of the wall. And I, 
I guess that's what the Tesla doesn't have. It fell out or no. The, I guess I think it, I read it and it was like fabric. Fabric seems like a weird thing to use there, but that it's just a guard to keep the water from splashing in. Because uh. you know, when you're driving along, those front tires are just throwing water, mm. and it very slowly will fill up the bumper. But if you drive a lot in the rain, then well, at least that's not leading to car fires. That is unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the picture's worth a thousand words here. That's a raging fire. This happened while driving. Something fell off a truck, as the headline says, and hit this Model S, which then burst into flames. Uh, now, they talk about how they expect if, the, if it took the same kind of damage with a traditional car, it would have been catastrophic, but it might not have burst into flames. I mean, it doesn't look like the, it's the front of the car, so it doesn't, I don't think the gas tank would have taken the hit. In, in before, you know, statistically, I don't know that Teslas catch on fire any more often than internal combustion well, cars, but... This is electric, so they are like the number one Tesla apologists. They uh, were quick to point that out. <laughs> That's like, no, it's fine. Any car that got hit by a piece of thing, something falling off a truck would blow up. It's fine. Don't worry. They're still great. Go buy them. I was in a car that got hit by a piece of rebar once, and it came up through the uh, the, the floor. That was kind of scary. Yeah, it's alarming that they burn with such ferocity and tend to burst into flame while driving. But to say that a car was destroyed by being hit by road debris, eh, yeah, could happen to anybody, I guess. <laughs> and then that brings us to another terrible report. Now, this is from... Uh, "Quote unquote internal documents." No, I want to put a positive spin on this. Tesla has met its five thousand <laughs> Model Three goal. It is met. Grueling. I'm. 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 I must reject the negative connotations of the word grueling in this headline. So the glass is half full <laughs> of piss. <laughs> so what? What they're saying here is, when you build five thousand cars, what percentage of them are perfect after you've built them? Now, apparently Toyota, with their insane Japanese manufacturing strategies, can hit something like 80%. So 20% of Toyotas come off the line, they test them, they look them over, they're perfect. Tesla, during the, the 5,000 crunch, 14% wow. were good. The rest had to go back. Could be small things. Could be like those fabric panels, which apparently they still didn't get all of them. <laughs> but... It's just, they talk about how it's not so much a question of whether the cars are still good, although that UBS report would say that, you know, they're, they're not great. But it's more about, like, how much cash are we burning just redoing work? Mm. And the answer is a lot. When you're make, when 4,000 and so have to be redone every week. The big news, though, is whatever happened to the whole public-private thing? You can't even see the headline here because of the New York Times paywall. But that's okay because we've already read it and we can tell you about it. And I'm pretty sure everybody's already heard. Yeah. They're not going to go private. No. The funding was never secured. <laughs> I wonder if the FCC is going to leave it alone now. or Because there, no. there, there was a blog post to go with this. If you haven't, you should go, go read Elon's blog, blog post. Because he's like, you know, there were a lot of investors that said that it's easier for them to invest if it's a public company, and they would find a way to invest if we went private, but gosh darn it, we just don't want to be hard on those investors. Right, yeah. Which is total bullshit. Uh, actually, the Saudis ended up going with a different company. Hmm. Yeah, so that's definitely not true. He hired two different, uh, I think he hired Morgan Stanley and then maybe Goldman Sachs. And I think that was like, hey, find a way for all of our public investors to turn into private investors. And I think the answer they came back with is, you're crazy. It's, you just, it doesn't work like that. If you want it to work like that, you know what you do? You run a public company. So uh, he, I think he got told no. And then the blog post was basically like, you know what? I've decided. <laughs> but yeah, the SEC, they're not going to. So there was supposedly uh, someone from the SEC leaked. He was like, we rarely see this level of pressure from the public and from the lawmakers to not just ignore something. So like people are calling for blood <laughs> for the funding secured thing. Pro probably just the short sellers and nobody else. It's so clear cut that he violated rules there. Like there is no way around it <laughs> of what he did. 
<laughs> so, yeah, it turns out that allowing a public fund to invest in private companies is a great way to steal money from the, the fund. So that's well, why that's not allowed. The Yeah, there are rules. So there's only a certain percentage you can put into a private company. Yeah. And it costs more and, you, you know, you have to worry about it more. So and a publicly traded company has accounting rules and stuff exactly, that I have to comply yeah. with. Such as the SEC. <laughs> You're not allowed to do things like make tweets that move the stock price $80. And so all of this rolled into a ball. JP Morgan took a look at it and they said, uh, you know what? Uh, we're going to downgrade this stock. We think it's worth $195 a share. Wow. Cur that, that's insane. Currently, I think it's at like 322 That's not terrible. That's, that's about where it was. Oh, it, it peaked at like 380 right? But it was right around uh, the low 300s before all the conference call. And I guess the next quarter's uh, earnings call is going to make or break that yeah it'll be interesting see they were also they gave a no comment when asked if they were still producing five thousand a week hmm which means no so they went through all that they burned money and they fixed all the bad work to get the five thousand milestone and get the headline but it seems like that might have declined now and now they got to worry about the bumpers and all this new stuff because you know ubs is going to tear another one down oh yeah and so they need to get the guy that's putting the garbage ones back together and see what his thoughts are because he's probably got some inside <laughs> knowledge. It's like, oh, yeah, on every scrap Tesla I, I've checked, it's been you, this problem. Would you do anything to help them if you were him? I wouldn't. No, the guy that's doing scrapping, the Tesla scrapping. But they won't give him what they he needs. Give, mm -hmm. So why would you? I mean, I'd maybe charge him a hefty sum. But no, nah, I'd, I'd just tell him to pack sand. I think he's doing pretty well with his little business. So, And actually, it's like the, the war on drugs. Right, you enrich the cartels because you limit the supply of drugs to one powerful entity. <laughs> that guy is going to get rich just because nobody else can fix Teslas. That's a level one red pill for you. Mm. <laughs> well, that's the end of the Tesla news. So if you were, uh, you know, had your thumbs in your ears and you were just like, man, that entire time because you can't stand to hear it, it's over. <laughs> There's two things. One, you can watch videos at a higher rate on YouTube, and that actually counts as more engagement for some reason. I don't know why. Go figure, YouTube. And two, there are timestamps in every video since we've ever done, and you can use the timestamps to skip around. Well, we've heard about a lot of people who are upset about Google and Apple because, much like those drug cartels, they demand a hefty price. <laughs> <laughs> the, is that the VIG? They call that the VIG, right? That's in gambling. <laughs> so you put something on the App Store, Apple or Google, you pay them a price. And you don't just pay, a, was it $100 to get on the Apple App Store, I think? You also have to be a developer. That's the $100. Oh, okay. And then, I don't know if Google has that, but then you post your app and every sale that you make, they get a cut. But they also get a cut of every transaction yeah. that goes through your app. So... If you're Netflix and I keep resubscribing, guess what? They get 30% of that. Mm, Netflix is not going to like that. And so they're trying to get around it. This is basically just uh, just redirecting to the web. Yeah. It's, that seems okay. Apple has explicitly said, don't do that. But, I, you know. But what are they going to get rid of Netflix? Yeah. So I mean, if wh who shoots first? If Apple gets rid of Netflix, how many customers do they lose because you can watch Netflix on Google? I don't think that would affect Apple at all. I think Apple users would just think, oh, that's weird, and just go on about their day and not nah, even really think about it. I think you're it. underestimating uh, <laughs> Netflix. Netflix is big. You can still watch Netflix in the browser, although it's probably not as good of an experience. I have. And you can't download. Like on, on an iPad, it'd probably be a worse experience because you can't download to the movies and watch them offline. I've only watched Netflix on a Surface, so I've not really tried it on the mobile platform. But I bet it would matter. So they're probably going to let them get away with that, just like Fortnite. They're yeah. going to let Fortnite get away with it. Oh, we got a lot of Fortnite news the, later, it's though. It's the biggest game in the history of gaming. <laughs> well, we talked about, uh, I remember, was it Germany that was getting rid of Linux? Yep. And we thought, mm, you I mean, know, Something smells fishy here. Could, could some money have changed hands there? Well, we're not sure about that, but uh, how about Hungary? <laughs> the Wall Street Journal, uh, this story is delicious. Microsoft has been hit with bribery probe in over details in Hungary. And so the thing that we thought maybe would play out in Germany basically played out in Hungary. Well, that's uh, allegedly. We have to say <laughs> allegedly. And what happened is 
they wanted Hungary to, to get uh, Microsoft Office products. So Microsoft Office products, here's another red pill for you. Software costs different amounts based on how rich a country is. Yeah. So if you're in a poor country, Microsoft Office is not worth the same as it is in America. And you're sitting there thinking, but wait, it's the same software, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's not really worth what you're paying for it. They're willing to take a much lower price. Yeah. So what they did is they sold this software to a local redistributor of software for pennies on the dollar. And then that redistributor on the books sold that software to the government at full price. The suspicion is the difference went to bribing the government to adopt <laughs> Microsoft. And I think it's, I mean, it seems kind of likely. That sounds like the VIG with more steps. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, but to Microsoft, it's worth it because, you know, you get your stuff in the government. And going forward, they're going to be buying new stuff and renewing licenses and stuff like that. Huh. But why else would you use a middleman? Yeah, no, I, that makes no sense. It makes no sense at all. The uh, the I mean, it's, that's there are good versions of that. Like if you're a Microsoft partner, you can buy software at a discount from Microsoft, but you are expected to charge the customer the difference to make up the pricing in order to close the deal. But it's not pennies on the dollar. I don't know exactly how much it was, but it was much lower. Yeah, enough that it raised a red flag. <laughs> enough so. that there's an article about it that we included yeah. in the level one. News. Well, there's an investigation. So. <laughs> Now, here's an interesting one. I, you know, I guess you got to give them credit. Little Walmart, it's like David and Goliath with Amazon. And boy, do they want to take on Amazon, but I, I don't like their chances, do you? <laughs> Walmart is launching an online store for ebooks and audiobooks. I remember when, when Walmart added a book section, and I was like, wow, this is really nice. And then within two weeks, that section was half as big. And then another two weeks later, it was like one shelf of magazines. And it is all like celebrity books yeah. and romance novels. It wasn't that way at first. At yeah. first, it was like the top 200 bestsellers. And then it was like, oh, people who go to Walmart are not buying the, the bestsellers. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, you know, it's Danielle Steele. Yeah. Is she still hot among yeah. the like, stay-at-home moms? I don't even know anymore. I'm sure there's a new one. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it's a sad little book section. But they've got this, uh, was it Kobo or Coco or something? Some other ebook reader who's trying to get in the game. So they've got their own hardware and they've got their own store, like uh, Kindle store, and they're going to make a go of it. Uh, this is another, you know, I mean, it's a stereotype, but uh, I actually had to go to Walmart yesterday because here in the, <laughs> the good old US of A, you can still buy nine millimeter at Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> I got to give them that. You know, that's a, that's a great thing. But good Lord, the people at Walmart. Oh, <laughs> uh, this is my, my regular time to plug the people of Walmart.com for your viewing pleasure. I bet Walmart has tried really hard to get to, to get that shut down. Uh, but if it brings in some people who are like, you know, people watching, maybe they'll buy something. <laughs> maybe they'll buy one of those little cups of uh, chicken nuggets that you get at the front while they're watching the people, like a refreshments. I remember when Walmart had um, a restaurant in the back. It was all the way in the back of the store, and it wasn't bad. Like, you could get chicken yeah. wings and hot dogs and stuff for, for nothing. It was, it was good food. That was in, like, the 90s. But then yeah. Subway came along. Yeah. And now it's Subway. And not there anymore in that particular Walmart. Do they not have the subway anymore? Uh, it's not. Well, there's no restaurant in the back. It's just produce and the deli now. Sad. Sad days when you can't get a cancerous hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, Speaking of things that are cancerous. Last week we talked about there were some rumors. And those rumors appear to have come true immediately after we filmed it. <laughs> Steam gets some built-in tools to let you run Windows games on Linux, now available in beta. So this is, Steam, Valve is using something called Proton, but Proton is a bunch of things. It's Wine and DXVK, which we've done videos on. We did the collaboration with Linus Tech Tips and all sorts of stuff, but it's now built into Steam, so it's even easier than ever. And we're working on a separate video on that, but if you're into Linux and you've got Steam set up on Linux already, you can go play a bunch of your Windows games on Linux. There's not yeah. really a lot of games on the list, though. You have to opt into the beta. There's instructions on that site, which here's another reminder. If you're new or you don't read the one tab link in the description links to all these stories. That's how you find the people complain. It's like, there's no links to the store. You got timestamps, but not links. What the hell? It's in the one tab link. Yeah. So yeah, you get it. You follow those instructions. You opt into the beta and they're actually scouring through the games library 
And as they test them and find good experiences in Linux, they will add them. There's a list. there's a checkbox preference thing that you can set and turn it on, and it'll let you play your entire Windows catalog on Linux, or at least attempt to, but support for that varies. Like Witcher 3 is not included in the list of officially supported games, but basically it's completely fine. And speaking of Witcher 3, I bet you didn't even know that you segued there. Do you know who makes Witcher 3? The CD Projekt Red. You know what else CD Projekt is doing? Terrible, terrible things. Fuck them. <laughs> GOG, the distribution platform for DRM feed video games, has launched a new initiative designed to promote content without embedding the DRM. Woo! It, the Steam announcement actually says that there are some games they're working with publishers on that work except for the DRM. If you've never used GOG, when you buy a game on GOG, there is literally no DRM. You can download executable files. And you can give them to your friends if you want to. You probably shouldn't because, God, they're fighting the good fight. You know, yeah. you should support them. But, yeah, no DRM. And if a game comes out with DRM, they won't sell it. So they're fighting the good fight, and they're trying to launch Fookderm as a way <laughs> to not just do DRM-free games, but also music and books. They don't have a lot of selection right now. Not, no. not a lot of people. I remember, I don't know if they still do, but Amazon used to give you DRM-free MP3s for a yeah. dollar. Uh, Which was nice. It's still it's still very easy and possible to get DRM. I, I like MP3s. Going DRM is actually a fun story because when we you know first started with iTunes, it was that terrible proprietary format, and you know every time you upgraded iTunes, it was like let me go through and give you a new and different codec, and it's like you could burn that onto an audio CD, a regular analog audio CD, and then uh, re rewrap re rip that back to a DRM free format. Did you say but, chisel that onto a stone tablet? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, that was how you, yeah, that was how you, you know, you could have a, like a thing that would work on your Zune or, you know, your, <laughs> <Rio>. <laughs> your what? <laughs> Did you say quill and parchment? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, now this is a story that I'm sure you had the same idea when you read it. It was like, yeah, I wish. Yeah. You spend more than five hours each week checking your email. I spend more than five hours responding to emails I should not have to respond to. <laughs> Never mind the legit ones, yeah. which is probably another five or ten hours. But this is unsurprising. It's uh, no, this is white collar, white collar jobs, of course. You know, I mean, if you're, you know, a plumber, you probably don't answer a lot of emails. But it's and probably happier for it too. Yeah, it's a terrible, terrible time sink because people send emails that they don't, they shouldn't, they are far too verbose in emails demand meetings that could be an email. There's yeah, there's a, but I mean, even worse is when the phone call comes, right? <laughs> Cause I, and, and we do have some clients who are, their reading comprehension is staggeringly low. Like I can't even, sometimes I think they're just messing with me <laughs> cause it's like, really? Really, you can't work this out from this description. And I have, and I have that in my mind when I'm talking it. I'm like, all right, third grade. <laughs> That's what we're aiming for here. <laughs> Monosyllabic. That's the, that's the word of the day. That doesn't help. But you're, you're, it's unfortunate. At least this is being recognized. Yeah, you're wasting your life. I don't know. That, now, they talk about things like Slack. And, you know, that kind of stuff to defeat it. But I think that's almost worse in a lot of ways. Slack has been worse in my experience because it encourages immediate responses. Right. And productivity grinds to a halt as a result. What, was it the week you were gone and we talked about that uh, Chinese software? Maybe. It's So it's like Slack. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I was here. Yeah, but it hits every Everything communication device that you have all at the same time. Yeah. And they're just, like, ready to jump out the window because yeah. of it. No, I, I have some people that do that. Anyway, like I yeah. have, there, there are some things where it's like, it's a, you know, it's an emergency situation. The plane is on fire. The engine is on fire. And it's like, I get the email that's like, Hey, uh, are you working on this? And it's like, we're all in the plane together. The engine is on fire. If the plane goes down, we're all going to die. And then it's like, you know, then I get the thing over the intercom. Hey, are you still, are you still at the front of the plane piloting? And then like the knock on the pilot door, it's like, Hey, are you still in the cockpit piloting? And it's like, we're all in the plane. The plane is on fire. I'm still here. It's fine. I don't. I, I didn't need to respond to these seven things. Well, as Wendell put it, the biggest possible news this week. Forget all the 
geopolitical shitstorm that's going down in Washington and you know <laughs> all that bad news stuff we always report on. We got new graphics had, uh, cards coming. This week was the <laughs> the record number of murders in Mexico ever. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But the big news is the RTX graphic cards from NVIDIA. <laughs> and uh yeah. yeah, they they do seem to be very powerful. Also very expensive. <clears throat> also very shrouded, shrouded in mystery because NVIDIA is being real obtuse about some of the performance numbers here. And they, the, uh, the uh, prices they announced at the press conference. Kind of high. But they weren't even the real prices. The real prices were much higher. <laughs> Oops. So, yeah, they sounded a little too good to be true. Now, you're probably thinking, should I buy? The, you, you don't want to hear any of the, the crap. You're just like... Green or red? Yes or no? What do I do? And Tom's Hardware is here to tell you, you shouldn't buy the RTX graphic cards. Under no circumstance. They lay it out. They put it right there in the headline. You should not do it. Yet. But Tom's Hardware says... <laughs> well, this is the next day. <laughs> you should buy them. Just go out and buy them. Don't even think about it. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What, what, what company said not to? Oh, Tom's Hardware. And then on the pro side, oh, Tom's Hardware. <laughs> well, the, in fairness, you shouldn't buy it yet. And then the next day, they got the extra information <laughs> they needed. And it's like, no, it's cool. Go right ahead. The extra information being, <laughs> we're going to stop advertising. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The extra information. You know, NVIDIA. You know, NVIDIA pulling the sponsorship plug. That's what you're talking about. That right. seems, yeah, exactly. That seems likely. So... Yeah, I just, I don't know. It didn't seem to matter because uh, if you pre-order one now, it's going to be like November or something. But I, the way that the press release is set up and the right way that the numbers have been released, it smells like Hairworks all over again. Because when Hairworks came out, it was like, look how much slower other graphics cards are at rendering Hairworks in software. And of course, it was just, you know, other cards that weren't set up for that were just glacial. But Hairworks was insanely fast on on those cards. And so with the ray tracing and all the other stuff that games don't really yet take advantage of, other cards are going to be slower. But for the games that are out today, how much faster are those just just drop in, you know, launch day ready? And I, it doesn't seem like it's going to be that dramatically faster. It looks like a 1080 Ti and a 2080 are going to have similar performance. Maybe the 2080 Ti is going to be like 5 or 10% faster, but is that worth $100 more? Because it's going to be $100 more. And by the time ray tracing hits prime time, there's going to be competitive cards out there. You would They're going think to be way better than this one. It'll, so. it'll probably be at least a full generation, maybe two, before ray tracing well, is a thing. I'm sure they'll do a couple of like flagship games. Because NVIDIA will literally subsidize yeah. the development cost of those games. Because they can. And they'll try, to, yeah, they'll try to make it something that everybody wants. Maybe like a big IP. But... Is that a reason to get to pay a thousand dollars or twelve hundred dollars for a graphics card? No, mm. I don't think so. And the, there are some indications that they're planning on an even higher end card, which is maybe the, you know, the Titan version of this card, which is even more. I mean, the silicon die on that thing is huge. It's GDDR six. You know, we know the specs, but there's not really any like super good hands on performance, whatever. But we we of course pre ordered them at level one because we're gluttons for punishment. Pre order culture. We're not, we didn't pre-order it. We pre-ordered it for you because you weren't going to be able to get it on time. <laughs> I can't keep a straight face while this I'm is, That's it. like when your parents beating you and they're like, I do this for you. <laughs> I wonder what Tom's did because Tom, like, Tom, there's no point in Tom's getting one. Can we have Tom's hardware? Because there's no point in... <laughs> well, in, they, 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 they don't need to test it. It's, they probably got theirs for free, but then they were told you're never getting anything else for free. No, I don't think that they... I don't think anybody has... I mean, maybe, but because of the article from Tom, so it's Oh, maybe like, they're trying to con assure that they do get one. Oh. Mm, yeah. It's like, uh, we don't need to test it. You should just buy it. And it's like, mm, no, this smells like... I mean, remember when PhysX was patched out of the driver and remember hair works and, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's it's awesome. I'm super excited about seeing new technologies and graphics cards and like the TensorFlow stuff. Genuinely, very excited about that. But how do we, you know, how do we sna snatch defeat from the jaws of victory here? I mean, Nvidia doesn't have to be dicks about having like the most amazing graphics cards ever because that's what this smells like. Well, I actually expected a 
another, we usually do government first. And I expect another story to come before this one. So we've lost the, the, the lead into this. But there is the, the Russian specter. It hangs over <laughs> everything we do here in America. If you're going to, if you're at a vending machine, the Russians are probably spying on you somehow. Then your vending machine choices. And they're going to use that to try and make you vote for Trump. That's, that's the, the narrative. And so the, uh, the tech companies, the big social media companies, they're getting together, trying to figure out a way to stop that from happening. <laughs> I read this headline and I started reading in, into the article and the picture that I had in my mind was tech companies are gathering for a secret meeting to prepare for a 2018 election strategy. And it was like, oh, the world really is run by the Pentaveret. You know, the Gettys and the Rothschilds or everybody's getting together and said, no, th this is talking about how they're trying to prepare for uh, malicious actors buying ads and exploiting their platform to uh, make people riled up about nothing. Does anybody other than malicious actors buy political ads? <laughs> so we should just ban political <laughs> ads. Man. Just, That'd be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> political ads can only be like, this is the client or this is the candidate's position on the following matters. And that's just very, very, it's like government peanut butter levels of factual and dry. Yeah, that'd be nice. Wouldn't be very effective though. No. Nobody would pay attention. to Nobody it. would read. Well, maybe that would work though. Maybe maybe uh, like the people on CNBC and CNN and stuff could read that and get outraged, and so like the outrage machine would be one level insulated from the actual political people. Mm, I don't know if they'd watch that either. That'd be interesting to see. I don't know. Of course, the problem with that is you're entering into free speech because <laughs> First yeah. Amendment isn't just free speech. There's also like uh, religion and political and press and well, right together. Is it free speech or is the platform owned and controlled by a private entity where free speech doesn't apply? Well, actually, I, that's I I totally believe that is the case, and that it should be. If you own a company, it's like owning a home. You get to control what goes on there, and. A judge has agreed. <laughs> Twitter has beat the censorship lawsuit by the banned white nationalists. The, the judge has said, no, Twitter is their own platform. They can do whatever they want. It's not a free speech platform because it's privately owned. This person was a very unapologetic white nationalist. So I, don't, I hope that did not weigh into this decision, right? Because it should be, it doesn't matter what you're talking about. Twitter can ban you for whatever reason. And not just because it's something that's, you know, abhorrent, like white nationalism. <laughs> like YouTube can demonetize us for anything. Exactly. And it's disgusting and we suffer from it. But hey, you got to defend their right to do it. That's because, why you can join our Patreon. Yeah, that's how it works. Because as long as we're not adult film stars, Patreon's not going to ban us. <laughs> <laughs> God forbid. <laughs> but yeah, the, the Twitter, the Twitter has won that one. That will probably galvanize their new censorship muscles you know like they're they're gonna be they've got a court case now that defends their right to do whatever they want you think the pentaveret's gonna meet together to figure out how to shape online speech because that's probably a much more dangerous proposition than this well i think what they want is government control which is kind of the opposite of this well government control would reopen the free speech thing because if there was government oversight and government regulations then the white nationalists would be permitted under whatever government regulations that there are but they could easily just write that out of the regulations all they have to do is spend lobby dollars to change the laws which is easy for them i, I think it's a little bit of a pandora's box because if that were written in law then they would have to follow the law in order to not be running afoul of whatever the shared platform is. But by being private, they can do whatever they want and they don't necessarily open that can of worms. But everybody, like the Alex Jones thing, pivoted everybody on the, the correct side of that argument onto the regulation side. Yeah. Which is brilliant. That's scary. That's like a George Soros masterstroke. <laughs> That's like him sitting back and just conducting the orchestra. <laughs> yes. You will have regulation and you'll beg for it. <laughs> That's the kind of thing that I'm scared of, though. It's that coordinated action from multiple independent companies are, is perhaps the most dangerous thing. Well, I kind of lied to you earlier. I said the Tesla stories were over. We do have one more. <laughs> and It's not much. Yeah. Business Insider doesn't like that. Pro uh, ad blocking tip. And yes, we have capitulated and we've installed an ad blocker. We, we joined our Patreon. We don't want to. 
but we just we we just couldn't load all the stories. The tracking scripts are so aggressive now that no browser can deal with this many tabs open on major news websites. <laughs> pro operating system. I know that there are a few of you in the audience that work for Google. Uh, pro browser design team tip: uh, just take our one tabs, load them up in Chrome, and figure out why it crashes. I think we know why. We know why. Because these are all very mainstream news sites. And, but but Go Go Google can fix that from the inside somehow. The only the story here is... And uh, Mozilla. I'm not, I, we love Mozilla, too. Mozilla guys are... A lot of people hate Mozilla. But Musk has deleted his Instagram account or deactivated it. I don't think you can tell. <clears throat> it's just... It's a blank page when you go there. Five million followers. And, uh, or eight or whatever. Beyond that, he also has unfriended Grimes on Twitter. <laughs> For people that not in the know, you really got to check out last week's nonsense section because it was just a rabbit hole of insanity. That went on a little bit more. She apparently Instagrammed him one last time and claimed that he had her phone and she wanted it back. And that's why he deleted. Well, that article said that's maybe why he deleted his account. I mean, but seems like an unlikely thing. I don't know. And now we have some. I put this in the social section because GoFundMe is, you know, it's like crowdsourced. It's a, it's a cautionary tale. Social fund. You got to be, now, of course, accepting the level one Patreon. <laughs> you have to be very careful who you throw money at. But and we're not we're not guaranteeing anything like some you know ultimate goal with our Patreon. It's just like, hey, we pay some people to do work with this stuff, and you know we eventually Wendell breaks a lot of stuff. So we have this churn of money. A few things every now and then. And that's, and that's very helpful to keep it going. But we're not saying that we're going to, for example, end homelessness. And these two people said they were going to do that in one case of so, Johnny Bobbitt. He, 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 this is a GoFundMe where this homeless guy had a good, a genuine act of random kindness. And the story of this was posted on the internet. They collected $400,000 from GoFundMe, but it's not really super clear where the money went. And the homeless guy is still homeless, still addicted to, to drugs. And it, you know, the proposal was four hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money, and it could go into a trust fund and maybe set him up with a trailer or something and some transportation. And some of that maybe kind of happened, but then maybe didn't happen. And I don't know, it's a mess. So this, the the act of kindness you were talking about, this guy was homeless and he was panhandling, and this woman ran out of gas right in front of him. And she didn't have any money or credit cards or something. So he had $20 in panhandling money, and he bought her gas. And so it was this feel-good story, and they went on the Internet, and they were like, oh, my God, on social media, we're going to start a GoFundMe. And everybody, all you bleeding hearts, crowdfunding people, went in there. And was it four hundred or 200000 It was 400000 And they Okay, so, it was, so they spent half of it, they claim. So far, yeah. Actually, so they bought him a trailer. They said they were going to buy him a house. They bought him a trailer, and they had some land. They put the trailer on the land, and he lived there. But now he's homeless again? They bought him new clothes and stuff like that. They claim they spent 200000 on a variety of things. And now he's back to homelessness, but he admitted he's also back on meth. I think it's meth. Some kind of drug. <laughs> and they claim that they still have the, under, the other 200000 but they're not going to give it to him as long as he's on drugs because he would basically just overdose and die. <laughs> Must have been a bad batch. Did he take somebody's cheese grater? I don't. But he, he says that th they spent the money on themselves. Yeah. So, so he, he shows that they bought a new BMW, which is true. It's in, their, it's in the, the lot of their house. They have it. They uh, vacationed in a variety of places this last year. Seems like a lot of vacation for their jobs and stuff. And then they're just saying, hey, he's a drug addict and can't be trusted. I think probably both sides <laughs> are terrible people here. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Be careful. What you fund on GoFundMe. And taking in homeless people. Yeah. Yeah. Taking it's, in homeless. Uh, mm. I mean, it's, it makes you feel good and everything. You, in the modern world, people who are homeless, and I'm not saying it's necessarily bad. That's how you want to live. <laughs> Go for it. They're usually homeless by choice. My track record is about one for seven. Yeah. And the one the one was a marginal success. And marginal. And you lost some money. Yeah. 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 Wendell's not a great judge of character. <laughs> 
Turns as, out. As we've learned <laughs> in several of his business endeavors. <laughs> I just try to be a good person. <laughs> little, uh, little naive, but, you know, I'm learning. Well, how trustworthy are the homeless people? How can we, how can we have a rating to tell numerically how trustworthy these homeless people are? Who, Fa- could, who could give us that? Facebook is working on that. And uh, the Washington Post is, has has blocked this, but you, this, you really owe it to yourself to go read this. Just, this uh, is an amazing article. If you get on the one tab and you hit this page, this is a cookie. Just delete the cookie or go incognito. Washington Post not real good at their paywall. There are so many stories we have this week where it could be juxtaposed next to stories from from times gone by. But Facebook well, is is yeah. built it's it's building social like, credit. Yeah, it's from China. It's literally the same thing. But this is a private company with no government oversight building it versus China, who is doing it institutionally. And I honestly don't know which is worse. But I'll tell you, Facebook is worse, and it's the reason I always say about China. China is horrible. They violate human rights. The, it's it's a dictatorship it's totalitarian it's terrible but it is right there they'll write it down for you here's how it is here's your score you can check your score anytime you want facebook it's a secret helping homeless people doesn't improve your score we don't know in, uh, in china it probably does here no well we're not, not so sure much. what so the idea with facebook is of course the dreaded fake news and the russians and so they're saying that um for example alex jones right we, we like to talk about Alex Jones because he's, <laughs> he's a character. He's the definition he's of not real. a character. And uh, <laughs> Facebook, so when the, the, the left, they hate him. And they created this campaign to try to get rid of him. And it worked. Terrifyingly, <laughs> they, they got it. So when he would post something on Facebook, there was this campaign of people who were very well connected. And everybody would go and report it as false even if it might not be false. So that works both ways, of course. You know, both sides of the aisle will do it. And Facebook was trying to figure out a way. It's like, well, how do we get away from this activism that will report something as false, even when it might not be? And so that thus comes the the Facebook score. So if you have that pearl-clutching blue hair, her trustworthiness score is not going to be real super or, high. Or, you know, the the stars and bars waving white nationalist. <laughs> They're really two sides of the same coin. Yeah. So I guess that's an interesting thing, but that's why I say you should go read that because now, Facebook is, it's already implemented. They're just figuring out how to plug it in. Do you, I bet. Yeah. Well, this is a, uh, they're, they're sort of like beta testing it. So not everybody has a score. I'm sure they will. But do you think because of GDPR, the euros could request their score. Oh yeah, they would be entitled to it. They should. Yeah, they might be able to uh, request what actions led to their score being what it is. So you may find people that even exploit that. How long till you think we get like uh, like we have credit monitoring? You have Facebook score monitoring software. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the problem with any of this score monitoring software is that you, if you know how it works, they're really not super effective against people that are lawful evil. Well, that's. It's like the Google algorithm. Yeah. That's the reason that no one really knows how the Google page rank works exactly. Because if they did, <laughs> like in the early days, they would just game it. Yeah. Remember when browsers were just pure crawlers? <laughs> and you could just put like, you know, just hide words in your web page. And I was like, hmm, there's a lot of this on this page. <laughs> Oh, we've come so far. Now we're, you know, we're heading. I don't know. It's just that's enough for this episode. Let's 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 wait for the next episode to get more into that. Tomorrow we'll be talking about security and. I don't remember what the other one is. Robotics. Oh, yeah. Robots and AI. Robots and AI. So stay tuned for that. Mm-hmm.